Hi! In the previous video, I explained the idea behind attention. And in this video, I would like to expand on the idea to formally define self-attention and how it is used in natural language processing. As a reminder, here's what we did in the previous video. We had an utterance, let's say bank, of the river. And in this utterance, we had separate tokens. And for each token, we'd have a word embedding or a vector. And then these vectors would go into a attention mechanism. And the goal was that once these vectors come out of this attention mechanism, that we then end up with vectors that have a little bit more context. Now, the hope is that what this attention mechanism over here might do is give a little bit more context to the vectors that come out. And in this particular example, if I look at the token bank here, it is plausible that this vector, that it represents money. While because the word river is here, it shouldn't refer to money, but it should refer to the bank of the river as in the water bank. The hope is that this attention mechanism will be able to correct for that such that the embeddings that come out over here just have that extra bit of context. So what we'll now like to do is just zoom in on this attention mechanism that we've defined in the previous video and see if we can add some improvements. So let's start out with our four word embeddings. I'll, I'll assume that we still have four of them. So that means that each vector over here is just this array of numbers. But let's now say that I want to add context to the third vector. And again, it's, it's a vector of numbers. But let's repeat the steps that we have to take then. Well, the first step would be to calculate this dot product. And this would give us the scores. And again, the way that you would calculate one of these scores is if you have two arrays. So let's say I've got an array here with three elements, and I have this other array with three elements. Then I would multiply the first element with the first one, the second one, with the second one, the third one with the third one, etc. And then add all of these things together. And in this case, this would be a vector three, and this would be the fourth one. And, and there's a bunch of notations for this. Uh, some people like to write down this, that is the dot product representation. If they're both vectors, then the linear algebra people prefer this notation. But that's not terribly important. The important thing is, is that we have these numbers over here. So this was just a small sidetrack. So let, let's get back to the, uh, to the attention mechanism. Because these scores, they're great. But there is an issue, and that is that they can be any sort of value. And we do like to keep things a little bit contained. So the next step would be to normalize them. So that is going to give us new outputs yet again, and I'll denote these with W because these will be actual weights that we use for rescaling. Let's put the indices there as well. And then a nice properties of all of these weights is the sum of all the numbers that I've just drawn. So with regards to three, every single J there, well, that should be one. That means that we've normalized it properly. So that means that the sum over this axis is equal to one. And note that where we started out with vectors over here, we now have just numbers over here. And it's these weights that I'll use to reweigh my original array of numbers. And I'll draw them on top again, just to save on ink. But what I'm now gonna do is I'm gonna reweigh everything together and then combine it. And then we're almost there. So again, what we've done is we've taken these normalized weights and we've multiplied them together with these vectors again to get to our more contextualized word embedding that comes out. And to be specific, what comes out over here, that's an array again. This is a number, this is an array. And if I multiply them together, I get a new array out, but it's gonna be a weighted average of all the original ones that I've got over here. 
And I've currently only drawn the path from the third vector, right? So this is the contextualized representation of the third vector. But I will also repeat all of these steps for all the other ones. And I'm not going to draw all of that, but we are going to get the same shape out over here, right? And everything that comes out over here is also, again, a vector. So the shape of the thing going into all of this is the same shape as the thing going out. So all in all, what I've done here now is you could say, well, I've got these vectors at the bottom over here. And these vectors are now going into this attention block, such that what comes out are these contextualized embeddings that hopefully are able to learn from each other. Now, there's an interesting thing here, and it is that there are no weights in any of this. Everything that we're doing here doesn't require parameters that are updated during a training loop. But maybe if we actually introduce some of those parameters, then maybe we can learn more patterns. Then maybe we have a more flexible system. So maybe we should actually go ahead and introduce some weights to the system. And how can we do that? Well, let's have a look. So when I consider the vectors that I start with, they'll be v1, v2, v3, and v4, then they are used three times. They're used here at the bottom, they're used here on the side, and they are used here on top. So how about I don't change any of the operations that happen in the middle, but maybe I should add some weights right there, right where I've drawn the arrows. And maybe we can make a database analogy here. Because you could say that, hey, I have a query here. I'm asking to have the third vector get a little bit more context. And what am I querying here? Well, to, to again use the database analogy, you could say, oh, these are keys. And once I've combined the query with the keys, then I want to get back the values. Now, the analogy with databases doesn't hold perfectly here, but this analogy does give us an opportunity to give nice names to parameters. So what we'll do is we'll introduce query parameters, key parameters, and value parameters. So let's not think of a way of how we're able to do that. Well, I suppose one thing that I could do is in general, I can take any vector and a vector is usually one by K, right? So this is the dimensionality of that vector. And what I can always do is just multiply that out with a matrix. And in this case, what I'll just say is, well, let's say that that matrix is K by K. Then by doing this multiplication, I should get another vector out. And the shape of this vector would then be one by K as well. So how about this? I'm gonna create a matrix for all of my keys. And I'm just gonna multiply that here. So all of these vectors, they're just gonna get multiplied with this matrix here. And, and these will be the key matrices. And I can do something really similar over here. I'll just multiply with a big matrix MQ and th this will be my query matrix. And I can repeat this one more time on top here where I multiply this out with a value matrix. And by looking at it this way, you will now have an attention block that actually has things that you can train for. Because we could regard these matrices as weights that we are supposed to train. Now I don't want to go full in on the linear algebra here. I'll save that for another video. But by introducing these matrices, I can rewrite this schematically. Because by introducing these weights, we can redraw all of this as a neural network. So let's redraw all of it. And I'll assume that I'm starting out on the left-hand side with my word embeddings. And this is a collection of word embeddings. So every single embedding that's in here that represents an array of numbers. And let's now pass this collection through some linear layers. So let's say that all of these linear layers, they don't have a bias term. And if that's the case, then a linear layer is just like a matrix multiplication. So what I could go ahead and do then 
is I could say, well, let's call this linear layer the one for the keys, but this one for the queries, and finally this one for the values. And if we then perform a matrix multiplication of the output that comes out of the first two layers, well, then what comes out over here is a matrix with all of our scores. And if we then normalize that appropriately, well, then we have our normalized weights like before as well. And if I then finally multiply that together with my values, well, then what I'm gonna get out is this collection of contextualized embeddings. And all of this, When you put all of this together, this starts to look like a block that you could use in a neural network again. And often this is referred to as a self-attention block. And the nice thing about it, suppose that I've got these word embeddings going in on the bottom, and then I've got these self-attention blocks, I will have context being added twice after each other. And if all of this is followed up with a named entity recognition task, and if I then also have some data, well, then you're gonna get a gradient signal coming back. And that signal can be used to update this self-attention block. And what's happening then? Well, signal's coming in, and it's propagating information back, eventually, to the weights of my keys layer, of my queries layer, and of my values layer. So now I've got an attention mechanism that can learn and that I can click together. Now, there are still some improvements that we can make to this mechanism. And the main improvement is that we can turn this self-attention into a multi-headed attention. But this I'll leave for another video. And I hope that you'll stay tuned for that.